In this video, we continue our introduction to multiple regression by taking a closer look at the coefficients table, including testing and interpreting regression coefficients as part of a multiple regression model. So what does the coefficients table tell us? Well, we have a column labeled model that indicates this is model number one. To begin, we'll just look at one regression model at a time but later we'll see that we can examine several models in a single comprehensive analysis. We then have a list of the variables in our model and remember that the constant is just another term for the intercept. We then have the values for the unstandardized regression coefficients for each of the predictors plus the intercept and these are the values for our B0, B1, etc. Next to the unstandardized regression coefficient is the standard error for that regression coefficient, which is then followed by the standardized regression coefficient, or the beta. We then have the t-test for each regression coefficient. And remember, that's calculated by dividing the unstandardized regression coefficient by the standard error of the regression coefficient. So for example, if we look at school quality, the unstandardized regression coefficient was 0.066, and the standard error for the regression coefficient was 0.017. If we divide 0.066 by 0.017, we get 3.821. <laughs> yes. I know if you're following along at home and divided 0 0.066 by 0 0.017, you get a slightly different number, but that's due to both 0 0.066 and 0 0.017 being rounded to three decimal places. If you use non-rounded values, you get exactly 3.821. <laughs> Trust me, okay? And uh, we see then that the t-test for the school quality effect is in fact equal to 3.821. Now finally, we have the p-value for each of the regression coefficients. Note that the coefficients table does not include the degrees of freedom for the t-tests of the regression coefficients. I don't know why, but fortunately it's the same value as the residual degrees of freedom in the ANOVA table, which is 397 for this example. So based on the coefficients table, writing the regression equation is fairly straightforward. Y hat, our predicted outcome, grades is equal to b0 plus b1 times our first x, our first predictor, in this case that's school quality, plus b2 times x2, our second predictor, which is study hours. We then plug in values for b0, b1, and b2 based on the results in the coefficient table. b0 is equal to 1.04, so we enter that B1, the effect of school quality, is equal to 0 0.066, so we'll enter that. And B2, the effect for study hours, is equal to 0 0.057. Now this is our regression equation. This is what we use to predict scores on the outcome based on, participate, based on the participants' values on these predictor variables. For example, if a student attended a school with a quality score of 9 and they studied 12 hours per week, their predicted grades would be 1.040 plus 0 0.066 times 9 plus 0 0.057 times 12 or 2.318. <laughs> Tough school, but again, this is made up data. Now, while we're here, we can also look at the t-test to determine whether the effect of school quality and study hours is statistically significant or not equal to zero. The t-test for the intercept term was equal to 6.437, 
while the t-test for the school quality effect was 3.821 and the t-test for study hours was 3.483. All of these t-tests have 397 degrees of freedom, which remember we got from the residual degrees of freedom in the ANOVA table. And in the p-value column, we see that all of these t-tests were statistically significant, meaning that we're convinced that each of these values is sufficiently different from zero that we can reject the null hypothesis that the values are in fact zero in the population. We can reject the null hypothesis that they have no effect in the population. In other words, if the size of these effects in the population was in fact equal to zero, if nothing was happening, it's so unlikely that we would see regression coefficients this large in our sample that we conclude their values in the population can't be zero. Well, it's highly unlikely to be zero. For example, the p equal to 0 0.001 for study hours tells us that if the effect of study hours was truly zero in the population, the probability is only 0 0.001 that we would have randomly ended up with a sample that had an effect this large, b equals 0 0.057, or larger. That's only one-tenth of one percent of the time. <laughs> We're just not that lucky to randomly stumble on that type of a sample. Now, you may ask yourself, well, that's the t-test for the unstandardized regression coefficient. What about the standardized regression coefficient? Where's the t-test for that? <laughs> well, it is the t-test for the standardized regression coefficient as well. It's the same test. It's also the same t-test for some other related measures that we'll talk about later, the partial and semi-partial correlation. That one t-test is the same t-test for all of those effects. It's kind of like the Costco of statistical analyses. Since you can literally buy everything you need from birth to death. Oh my god. It does everything. But if you think about it for a moment, that's not too surprising. For example, the standardized and unstandardized regression coefficients are both measuring the same thing. The strength and direction of the association between a specific predictor and the outcome controlling for all of the other predictors in the model. They're just based on different metrics, the raw units for the unstandardized coefficient and standard deviations or z-scores for the standardized coefficient. So if it's statistically significant for one, it's just as statistically significant for the other. Now, when we talk about the results, there are specific ways we need to report the analyses and specific language we need to use in order to be precise and accurate. Let's use the school quality variable as an example. When you report the results, you need to include the regression coefficient and the t-test results, including the degrees of freedom and the p-value. Specifically, you'd report this as b equals 0 0.066 t with the degrees of freedom, 397, in parentheses, equals 3.821, and p is less than 0 0.001. Now, don't forget to include the degrees of freedom with your test statistic. You always need to include the degrees of freedom. It's vital information that allows the reader to potentially check your results. <laughs> More than once I've reviewed papers for journals where the degrees of freedom told me that the author had done something wrong. Their degrees of freedom were either impossibly large or ridiculously small, which at best says there's a problem with their data or sample. 
In your narrative, you might describe this effect as controlling for hours studying, school quality was statistically significant, and then list the regression coefficient, test statistic, degrees of freedom, and p-value. For now, you can think of controlling for as a way of saying, taking into consideration the effect of the other variables. Using our basketball analogy, it would be like asking how Shaq played, taking into consideration how the rest of the team played. Did he, had, did he add a unique oomph or contribution to the team's performance, or was he just part of the crowd? We'll dig deeper into this in an upcoming video. For study hours, the regression coefficient was b equals 0 0.057 with t with 397 degrees of freedom equal to 3.483 and the p-value equal to 0 0.001. You could report this in the paper by saying controlling for school quality, our studying was statistically significant, followed by the regression coefficient, the t, the, the t statistic, the degrees of freedom, and, and the p-value again. Again, make sure to include all that information. Now, just like in simple regression or really any analysis, don't interpret the size of any of these effects, whether it's the unstandardized coefficient, the standardized beta, the R squared, or as we'll talk about later, the change in R squared based on the p-value. The p-value does not indicate whether it's a large effect. The p-value only indicates how likely it is that the effect is just random, not how big it is. Okay? This wraps up our video series introducing you to the basics of multiple regression. Now, if the language of controlling for this or controlling for that seems a little murky right now, that's okay. Uh, we have another video series that really delve into what we mean by that. But for now, take care. Okay? Bye-bye.